Hi, welcome to Punch Size Talks, the business breakfast briefers. My name is Mark Owen, and each week I invite a panel of business experts to review the morning newspapers, find out what's happened in their own individual business and their own individual business sectors, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's punchline. But before I start, I'd just like to thank my wonderful sponsors, accountants, business advisors, Hayeswoods, and we couldn't do the show without them. Okay, let's meet the panel. Today we've got Matthew Burgess, he's the principal and CEO of Gloucestershire College, responsible for over a thousand staff, 15,000 students across three sites with turnover of £40 million. And we'll find out from, from him what's going on at the college, the latest developments on the new construction site they're doing down there as well. We've got Deborah Flint, she's the MD and joint owner of Cinder Hill Farm at St. Breville's, a staff of 16, making a staggering handmade rolls, sausage rolls, half a million a year. She was, last year she was on Channel 4 Cotswold Farm Shop and she's been on countless other television programmes, becoming a bit of a TV star, aren't you, Deborah? And it'd be lovely to see her again so we'll find out what's happening in her business. And we have Daniel O'Neill, the co-founder of ProCook, 60 Saws, 62.6 million turnover, 70, 700 staff. Last year he stood down from the day-to-day -day running of the business, but the company's just released their latest trading figures. So we'll find out what's uh, what's going on there in the retail industry as well. And last not least, we got Louise Neal. She's the CEO of Link Charity, supporting blood cancer patients and families across Gloucestershire, Hereford, South Gloucestershire. And uh, we'll find out all about that as well. Okay, before I start, let's uh, find out what's going on or what's making the headlines today. So it is all starting off with Starmer, says the Daily Mail. UK nuclear deterrent is safe in his hands. The I, Starmer, Labour will hike UK defence spending amid, amid threat from China and Russia. The Guardian, Labour warned over loss of urban seats in the election, the Financial Times. Tory election hopes hits as forecasts of interest rates cut as scale back. The Daily Express, bring to an end the triple lock pension injustice for millions, screams the Daily Express. The Daily Telegraph, border force to blame for fake stamps. The Mirror, infamous OJ dead at 76. The Sun, Good riddance, to, again, the OJ story, and the Metro, JK Rowling and the Gobbler of Ear. And the Times, consultants accused of covering up fatal flaws. This is whistleblowers lost their jobs after raising concerns about the police investigation. And finally, last not least, the Daily Star to win the Grand National. And that is happening tomorrow, which I can't wait. OK, let's get to the panel. Matthew, I'm going to start with you today. What have you chosen from the papers, please? Um, well, there's a few interesting things working in education. And there's a very interesting story um, in Tennessee in America where they've legalised teachers to, to bear arms, uh, which, is, which is slightly concerning. I've got to be honest, I'm not quite sure how to feel like as a parent saying I'd like to uh, enrol my child at this school and the teachers are all there with kind of oozy you know, machine guns and things. But hey, that's America. But but the one um, uh, that I think really kind of concerns me is is the, the news that uh, Meta, who own WhatsApp, are cutting the minimum age from 16 to 13 for, for people to start using WhatsApp. Um, and we know that, that you know, the, the links with kind of cyberbullying, sleep deprivation and harmful content among children. And, and we certainly see it um, at the college, you know, 16 year olds and and. I think people think it just is a kind of communication tool, but you look at the kind of stuff in gangs and things that's happening, and a big thing is about videoing and sharing. Um, and I think it's really concerning. We know about the impact of lots of social media on brain development and lots and lots of things, and it just does feel like um, profit is definitely ruling in terms of, 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 of you know, young people's kind of welfare. And, and, you know, what's the government thinking about, or should there be a ban on on you know, people buying smartphones before the age of 16, that's unlikely to really stop it. So I think this, this is a kind of really worrying development, um, both here and across the uh, the EU. I would imagine as well, obviously, working with so many young yeah. people, uh, the, the sort of health issues around mobile phones and the sort of bullied cyberbullying as well, 
you know, I mean, how do you control it in the college? I mean, how, where does your care well, we, stop yeah. us? So, so we do a lot around online safety, you know, and, and try to t t help people to know how to kind of protect themselves and, and what to do and things that we might kind of take for granted that young people don't necessarily in terms of privacy settings and all the rest of that. But a lot of the damage is done before then. And I guess you have seen that real change over the last kind of 10, 15 years. Um, you know, there is kind of significant bullying and, and self-image issues that, that, that young people have. So, yeah, for us, it's, it's what can we do that people are aware about how to keep themselves safe? Um, but, but that only goes so far. That if, if, if they're already hooked on it at age 13, it's a bit late when they come to us. No, I mean, when I was on holiday last, could believe it when, you know, you go for breakfast and there's a, like a three-year-old just stuck oh, with, with an iPad yeah. in front of them, you know, and uh, mum and dad are having a chat and they're, you know, they're just watching a film rather than connecting with the rest of the family. I mean, we all see that, don't we? Yeah, yeah. But, but, but it's what they're messaging each other about. And it's and it's the idea that, you know, people get invited to a group and then they're just like abused publicly, you know, and shamed publicly in a different way. And, and of course, we know WhatsApp is the... Uh, is the tool of choice for sexual predators because of end-to-end -end encryption. I mean, there's just so many risks around it, so many risks. It's just crazy. The government just doesn't seem to have a, 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 a handle on it at no. all. Thanks ever so much for that, uh, Matt. Uh, right, we're going to go over to you, Deborah, next. Uh, what have you picked out, please, from us? Well, after a splashy experience on our farm, thanks to the uh, torrential rains the other week, um, where we had our own... Uh, uh, units flooded as uh, too much rain came down the hill too fast for our own flood defences to cope with it. Um, I was very interested to see that, uh, I mean, we managed to clear ours up within about two or three hours and then uh, recommence production. Uh, but for, I mean, many farmers, the devastation is much longer lasting and uh, the recent news is that DEFRA have indeed agreed to make payments of up to 25,000, but your farm has to be no more, or the field that you're applying for, uh, support for, has to be no more than 150 metres away from the centre of a named river, and they've named the rivers. And I mean, any of us who've, who've driven around Gloucestershire in the recent past will have seen that 150 metres from the centre of the, the Severn or the Wise is, you know, just nowhere near the reach of the water itself. So, well, um, you know, I kind of feel that there are so many of us who either aren't registered for stewardship uh, payments or uh, live further away for, who, for whom, you know, there is no compensation, there is no support for, for flood, flood issues. I think if you're not in farming, it's such a, such a, a mindful of different, different rules and regulations that, you know, us in normal business have mm. no idea on really. Mm. Uh, I mean, especially when you've got animals like used to. I remember when we chatted. You used to have wild boars, and and now obviously, how many pigs have you got again, Deborah? Well, right now we have none on the farm because we're about to do the fencing on the farm. So um, all of our pigs at the moment are in North Yorkshire, so which is again not abnormal. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's anywhere. I've, the good thing about North Yorkshire is that the uh, it's very sandy, so the water drains away very quickly. So even so, it's very, very muddy and there are problems getting the, the, the trailers on and off the land up there. Mm. But oh. Well, we'll come, we'll come back to that. We'll talk about your own individual business as well. Have you picked out any other stories for us? Or is that, is that well, doing? I did pick out one which I'd recommend, which is uh, in The Guardian. It's a lovely piece. Uh, by Phoebe Taplin about holiday in the Forest of Dean without a car. And so obviously accessible to anyone from anywhere else in Gloucestershire, if you have uh, access to, to transport, you could come and enjoy. It. I mean, it's just full of wonderful things to do. I know many of the people who run the businesses and places that she mentions, um, but it does just, just show how accessible the, the forest is. is. Is this in The Guardian today? Yes, it, it's cool. Yeah, she, I can't remember what she called it, but anyway, it's about, uh, it's just in the, in the travel section about uh, visiting the Forest of Dean, so oh, worth sharing, cool. share further afield. <laughs> fantastic, that's great. Thanks ever so much for that. Daniel, what have you picked out for us, please? Um, I saw a couple of stories that caught my eye, so a slightly lighter uh, lighter side, but Lego, you you know you're successful when well, there's a black market in your product and, uh, and police in California have just busted a gang 
who had 300,000 of stolen Lego. <laughs> and uh, and the black market for a Millennium Falcon that retails at $850 is going for more than 1,000 on eBay. But yes, it's amazing how much Lego has just uh, taken over and Target now has to put it behind locked glass screens. So I thought that was uh, that was really interesting. Um, what? Uh, yeah, you know you've made it. I should be going up to my loft later and selling it. <laughs> I'm going to be fired on that. I've still got my old Lego stuff. It's not yeah. like these these kids nowadays yeah. that will be build farmhouses and Millennium Falklands and stuff yeah. like that. Just square windows and a few oh. doors and stuff, you know? Yeah. It's, it's amazing. What else? They're now the largest, they are the largest toy producer in the world now, Lego. Yeah. Wow. yeah. yeah. What's your story? And then uh, the other one that caught my eye was uh, was um, a guy who was going bold telling a story about it all and uh, and the six things that uh, were commonly said to him. Um, at least you have a nice shaped head, I thought was quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> I like your new haircut. It was, uh, yeah, that was, uh, uh, oh, thank God, when uh, obviously you finally take all your hair off. Um this is my favourite look on a man. Apparently, uh, three out of ten ladies prefer men with uh, with a bold head. Um, oh, so you've gold bold then, or oh my god, I didn't recognise you. So uh, I just thought. <laughs> <that was> bold. <laughs> I I can't know. I don't know what to say about that really. But anyway, <laughs> thanks very much. Okay, let's go over to you, Lou. What have you picked out for us today, please? Hi, uh, yeah, I found some really interesting stories, but the one that really caught my eye was in the eye. Um, it's actually, I was in National Paper, but it's a story about a Gloucestershire lady and it's around the state pension age. So she's saying she's 72 and still working uh, five days a week. Um, and she seems okay about it, but, it, you know, it, it's a bigger kind of issue. And they're basically saying that, you know, people in their 30s now, which I'm just hanging on to very, very <laughs> tentatively, um, may not get a state pension until they're 70 due to pressure on the system um, and Alison from Gloucestershire says about the fact that she's working she has a cleaning business and she enjoys it but she makes a really really interesting point because she says due to the fact that she's got good health um I work for Link we're a local blood cancer charity and we know that you know good health is a real privilege and something that a lot of people don't have and she really kind of understands how lucky she is because she is able to work um, but I think it's really important um, message, really, that actually, you know, people aren't as lucky as that. And actually, there's so much pressure then if you're not going to get a pension. She also makes the point that due to the cost of living crisis, although she's paid her mortgage off, uh, she still can't afford even with the um, the state pension as it is. So you can imagine without state pension where she'd be at Link, we've just given over a thousand pounds in the last week to blood cancer patients and their families who are struggling to afford real basic things um, due to their diagnosis, but also due to the cost of living. So I think it was a really, really interesting, um, interesting story. She also makes the point that it's not just her. A lot of her friends are also working five days a week in their 70s as well. And then juggling grandchildren and other life's pressures. So, um, yeah, interesting story, worrying story. Very good story as well. No, I don't know what I'd like to do actually. When you know, when when do you step away from? Or lots of business business people just can't at the end yeah. of it. They can't sell it. They can't do anything with it, especially this sort of uh, this time. Have you picked anything? Surely punchline still going when you're in your seventies, Mark. Come on. God, I hope so. But, uh, not by me on the helm. That's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we. I'm sure we'll be doing this program till I'm around eighty-five. Who knows? I know. But, <laughs> Thanks ever so much for that. Okay, let's go over to you, Matt, uh, and uh, and the college and everything else, because there's a big shiny building that's going over in Cheltenham, which is the new construction site as well. Can you just give us a, a yeah a about uh, that, please? And, and uh, I mean, we've 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 a lot of developments in Cheltenham in recent years. We're, we're, we're fortunate we're right on the back of the uh, of GCHQ and the proposed cyber park, and we we spent a lot of time on, on cyber and pleased. Um, Earlier this year, we won a national award for Digital Apprentice Provider of the Year, which was very nice indeed. Um, but the other area that's kind of big for us is, is construction. That's clearly a, a really significant area for the county and nationally. Lots of lots, you know, and if you if you can get out of a plumber, you're doing quite well, as you as you'll know, as a person, let alone businesses mm -hmm. struggling to recruit staff. And that's a that's a big theme for us. And of course, there's the emerging needs in terms of sustainable skills. We did a, a, a huge um decarbonisation project a couple of years ago I think you know about Mark um, 
and we found actually involved digging lots, digging lots of very big holes. We got ground source heat pumps and lots of M and E work. So um, we worked with Cheltenham Borough Council to put a bid together. So we're, we're building a, a five million pound centre. Um, Beard are the contractors. They're doing a fabulous job for us. We're we're, we're through the. Uh, the difficult bit insofar as it's kind of pretty much watertight now, the roof's on, the walls are going up. Um, so that'll open in September. Uh, it'll mean that we've got more capacity in Cheltenham to offer things like brickwork and carpentry, but also critically electrical and plumbing. They're the, they're the key skills in particular that, that you need. Um, you know, they're, they're in real, a real shortage. So yeah, we're really excited about that. We've got lots of applications um from the locality you know there's, there's been there is less provision in, in Cheltenham than Gloucester for lots of reasons so it's a really exciting time how many um, students are you hoping to go through the that sort of side of things Matt what, what demand is really significant at the moment because we're on an upward demographic trend but we would expect three or four hundred um to be using that center certainly within a couple of years you know, wow. once you get the second year. So some full time routes, some apprenticeship routes. So, yeah, it, it, it's it's going to make going to make a big difference. And and we've got a bit of construction offer there, but it makes it much more coherent um, rather than, than businesses and young people having to travel to Gloucester. We know lots of young people won't travel between Cheltenham and Gloucester and vice versa. Well, the big problem is, is, is let's be honest about it, it's the buses. Yeah. yeah, we can't get transport. You know, for the fact in the forest, it's, it's a big problem over yeah, there. Gosh, it's very the, difficult. The buses, there. Isn't it really? Yeah, um, and they, they they start with one route and then they change their mind around six months later. Yeah, yeah. And so I we're really excited. So there'll be a, a grand opening. And we'll, we'll let you know when that is. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that. Very quickly, the cyber side. Do you want yeah. to get a plug as well? Because yeah, one of the things I'm saying, you know, yeah, we've 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 been working really hard on 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 that one. We've got a, a few new programs coming on board this year. There's a new cyber pathway within the degree apprenticeship. Um, we've got a new um top up to degree level in terms of games design. So there's kind of there's a big computing offer over there. And obviously we're really excited about what's happening with the Golden Valley development. I think the Cheltenham Borough Council are being very brave. Um, in terms of what's happening. And, and I think there's this progress being made in terms of appointing, you know, who, who's going to be run the innovation centre. But I hope it kind of 26, 27, some of that will start coming together and we'll start seeing some real developments over the next few months because that's a big, big development for the town and, and for us. I know, couldn't say. And obviously we need Junction 10 as well. Absolutely. Apparently they don't have the, all the money yet for Junction no. 10. That's a big worry. And of course, it's all connected together, isn't it? That's Thanks right. Thanks so for that, Matt. It's always You're great welcome. what the college is doing. And uh, if you guys ever get the chance to, to go down there, it really is quite something. Dad, please do. Okay, let's go over to you then, uh, please, Daniel. And um, let's talk about your trading figures, actually, if that's okay, because you just released them this month. It's one of the stories that we ran this week, actually. Um, 62.6 million turnover, but there's a change, isn't it, from the online to the retail side of things? Can you explain about that? Yes, yeah, so we definitely, um, traditionally, um, homeware, especially kitchen wares, was, uh, was 75% bought in bricks and mortar stores. So um, there's still a real tendency for people to want to pick it up. And although we saw a massive growth in, uh, in online sales of kitchen wares during, uh, during the pandemic, it's amazing how that has migrated back to almost the same level now as pre-pandemic. Even though people experience, you know, sort of great service of buying online, um, people have naturally, I think, because they want to pick it up, they want to see that the, the sort of the dining set on a table. Um, they have migrated backwards. So we've seen we've seen them um, sales um in retail up almost 9% with about half of that coming from like for like stores. So it's been a really strong, it's been a really strong uh, period for us um, in terms of retail. Um, the web has been a little bit better. It, so on the, the year as a whole, it was around um, 9% um, down, but in the last quarter, just two. So we are seeing that web picture now improving, um, which is great to see. Is there is there a particular trend in the products and stuff? Is it still your you know your your your, your core? Well, our core products, products are doing really well, but we we've, we've launched um, within the last three months. We've launched small kitchen electrical, so kettles and toasters, which have gone down um, really really well with good housekeeping, uh, BBC Good Food and Witch. So we've we picked up some pretty good awards from those three titles, um, and then just more recently in the last month, we've launched. 
sort of stand mixers and 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 frothy milk makers, uh, chocolate makers, um, and so about six or seven a, a, a real um, a, a hot air um, grill um, combination, which has gone down really well as well. So that we're definitely seeing, and I see over the next year or two. Um, that really pushing our like for like sales forward. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's really exciting for Procook. The one thing um, I say about that, if you don't mind, is that the thing about when you sell a saucepan, right, is you're never going to see that saucepan again. You sold it or a set of knives. The thing about electricals, they do tend to bounce back. That there is a there is a problem with them, no matter what. Sometimes you know they do. Well, break. that that's been the reason why we it's it's we've waited till now really. It's being able to work with the really premium producers, um, the 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 likes of that uh, sort of of, of Smeg and Jewellet and KitchenAid. So you know, the, uh, and we wanted to work with those people, which requires a certain amount of volume. Um, but yes, we're 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 seeing um, return rates and fault rates um, uh, sort of below where uh, where we sort of anticipated. So it's uh, yeah, it's good. I think right finding the right partner in electrical is probably more important and as you say in a yeah. in a piece of cookware which it, it clearly you can see whether it's going to go wrong pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. But I yeah. love going to your stores, mate. The service is always fantastic. Where's the latest store that you've opened? Um we're just about to open uh, in Bracknell uh, in the next uh, week or two. Wow. Well, so, and it's uh, such yeah. a big investment as well. It must cost millions of quid to it's a couple of hundred thousand to open a store, yeah. So it's uh, it doesn't come cheap, but so, we generally will get we'll we'll get a cash payback, um, within twelve to eighteen months. So uh, it's pretty good. Wow, uh, and yeah. you obviously believe the high street still got there's still. Well, we certainly see, kicking. yeah, from retail numbers, we're certainly seeing for our category. I mean, that doesn't mean it's it's true of all categories, but I think for our category. Uh, Kitchenware has, has still got a, quite a bright future in retail, yeah. Okay, thanks. So it's a yeah. nice place to stop. But no, thanks ever so much for that. Let's go over to you, Deborah. Let's talk sausage roll because you know how big a fan I am of them. <laughs> I think you are <laughs> our biggest fan. <laughs> goes without saying. Let's 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 start because a lot of people maybe not know about it. So, how many sausage rolls do you make uh, a, a, a day? And uh, and just explain about the hand that you hand make them. Still, yeah, we do. They're, um, I mean, they are literally made by hand. So, you know, each they, they all have to be uh, formed, cut, uh, decorated, egged, uh, baked, removed, packed, topped, dated, uh, picked uh, before they go out. So, there's no machinery that makes any of that. Uh, it's all done by hand. And um, one of the reasons that, you know, we do get people asking, you know, can you make us a cheaper version of it? Uh, we'd like to, you know, we're used to buying our sausage rolls for 40p and selling them for two pounds. 40, we, you know, can you do something similar or something between the two? But uh, people want to be able to pipe, you know, piping the meat is what uh, makes it cheap. Uh, but uh, because we have such a high proportion of meat to the, uh in, in the in the sausage roll there's no way you can buy it it so, needs so you, good strong hands to form it yes i was going to say also being a chef myself we used to make long sausage rolls and you're all right you could even pipe it through so you actually physically squash it down and roll it out yes that's right yeah wow it is quite and it's, the, it's also very cold because you've got to keep the cold the meat cold so it's you know it does affect your hands quite a bit as well working with it now, one of the things I was very impressed with you is that you've also got a number of apprentices as well, haven't you? Well, I think probably partly because of our background, my background in development work. Um, you know, we moved here a little bit of good life and then, you know, gradually the business has kind of grown. Uh, to begin with, it was accidental, but now we're very deliberate in what we want to do, which is to kind of move forward employment practices and, uh, you know, try and showcase good employment uh, practices in the area. So um, we put a number of initiatives, Living Wage Foundation, we have Cycle to Work scheme, we have um, a, a national health top up insurance for staff, do a lot of training, team days, um, pub outings, you know, just trying to, 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 to bring people in and make it an attractive place, which you've got to do when there is no transport to bring people to your location. And, you know, people can't pop out to... Uh, the high street to go and do their shopping or get their lunch you know you've got to create a place that people want to come to work 
Um, but also looking at the longevity of the business, you know, talk, uh, Lou was talking about, you know, retirement ages and how do we get out of our businesses. And I'm a strong believer that you have to grow the people who will carry the business forward. So we have, yes, invested in, in uh, a number of different apprenticeships uh, for people coming in. Um, I have to say that I am bowled over with the quality of the education that you get from apprenticeships. It's so broad, everything from, you know, that we get youngsters coming in and they're asking me, you know, so what are what is our, you know, employment policy? What is our slavery policy? Yeah. You know, they, they, they help drive us in the questions that they're asking because of the apprenticeship um, format, as well as obviously creating very good chefs for us to, to create the sausage rolls. Well, Deborah, I'm going to, because we're running out of time, unfortunately, but you, there's your chance to plug Matthew's business for him, because obviously <laughs> the, these apprentices went to Gloucester College, didn't they? Well, we've got um, another one who's just started doing a degree level certified uh, manager's degree. So that's at the higher level. And that's come with support from Gloucester Services uh, providing us with levy. So, you know, there is opportunities for small businesses to talk to biz big businesses and to take some of the levy that they're yeah, not using yeah. to support them through, uh, you know, getting a degree without having to pay for it, without having debt, but actually being paid for it. So, you know, it's a, I think it's a good way, particularly in the forest, to help people to achieve higher levels of education. No, absolutely fantastic. Best sausage rolls ever. <laughs> Right, just okay. ensuring the future of the sort of role. That's, that's <laughs> the most important thing to me in business today. Right, let's go over. Thanks ever so much for that, Deborah. Lovely to catch up with you as always. Louise, let's go over to you, please. Right. Oh, I don't know how to follow Deborah in her sausage oh, roll. Really. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about the Link Charity. How long has it been going and the, and the really important role that you play, please? Yeah, of course. So Link Charity, for those of you who don't know, we're a, a small but very well known and loved local charity or regional charity. We serve and support blood cancer patients and their families across uh, Gloucestershire, Herefordshire and South Worcestershire. And we're in a really, really exciting year because we're celebrating our 25th anniversary, which is fantastic. We're one of the uh, most um, longest established hospital charities in the county, which is which is great. I'm very new, though, to Link. I only started last June. I'm incredibly proud of the work of this charity. Um, I guess if I just sort of sum up um, as concisely as possible, the sort of three main things that Link Charity does. First off, we fund clinical psychologists for all haematology patients um, across the trust. So if you have a blood cancer of any type, you, uh, you and your family, it's really important. It's not just the patient, the patient's obviously at the center, but cancer, as we know, has this horrendous ripple effect. And so um, all of those patients and family uh, members are able to um, access a clinical psychologist. And last November, that team, we, we knew they were fantastic, but they were actually nationally recognized through a Macmillan Award for quality improvement and excellence and service. So we're super proud of them. Um, the second thing we do is we pay also for a team that sits within the NHS and they're a research team. So they are trying to ensure that Gloucestershire based blood cancer patients are put into some sort of clinical trials and that can be around medical pathways it can be different ways of experiencing their diagnosis and opportunities of different ideas and technology that's available to them um, and that is just absolutely incredible because for such a small charity it has international reach so all those patients that are going on to those trials, we learn so much about the outcomes um, and it betters that blood cancer landscape picture right across the world which is really quite incredible we're very very proud of them and what we now know is that some of the things that were on trial a few years ago are now just part of standard of care the third thing that we do is we have a link fund and it's what i um, spoke briefly about earlier and this is a pot of money that we are able to free up for blood cancer patients and their families to help them because we know times are tough anyway but with a cancer diagnosis you can lose your job virtually overnight you're unable to work but the bills remain the same, right? So we have this pot of money and we, um, and yeah, and, and it's available and it's really quick. People can access it and within a day or two, it's in their bank account. And examples of this is, um, I've got full consent to share the story. A lady called Nikki last year had a very, very, um, very aggressive type of leukemia. She had a five-year-old son. She was not able to provide childcare 
pay for his childcare while she was having her chemotherapy. So we stepped in and paid for that. And it doesn't um, you know, make the cancer go away, of course. We're not trying to um, you know, change the world. But for that individual, Nikki is so grateful because it meant she can concentrate on her treatment and her little boy was being looked after in a really turbulent time. Um, and all sorts of different things, new fridge freezers, um, anything really, child play psychology sessions. There's a lot of adjustment around, obviously, a cancer diagnosis. Oh, just amazing work you do. And thanks ever so much for giving it. Sure. We've got a polo uh, that you could give a plug at the very end as well, unfortunately. Yes. I know that <laughs> Daniel's got to gotta go. So we're going to do the pick of the punchlines. Dan, what's your pick of the, this, this week's punchlines, please, sir? You still there? Uh... And me? Yeah, you, yeah. No, obviously, <laughs> obviously you're Kevin's story for Brokeup, just, obviously. Hey, look, I, just, be, just because I've gone out of turn, mate, you've got to keep an eye on the ball. <laughs> Goodness <laughs> gracious me. Look, I, you said you've got to go at half past. I'm giving you a chance I'm, to... Well, I, could, I, couldn't, I couldn't end early, cool, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still asking you, what's your pick of the punchline? Well, it had to be Brokeup because it needs story in punchline, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, the broken least story. Okay, thanks so much for that, Dan. Matt, what's your what's your pick of this week's bunch slides, please? Yeah, I picked two actually. It's the uh, they're, they're kind of related and a reason for it. It's the uh, the new uh, Baker's and Barista store at the Gloucester Keys, but also the work at the Baker's Key and Malt House development. And and I haven't been around on the you know I've, been, I've worked in Gloucester for like more than twenty five years, and we were as you know the kind of anchor anchor institution of the whole key scheme. How it's transformed is just incredible. And, and this is just the next stage. I think it's really exciting. Really exciting. Uh, did you watch my very windy video? It was a bit windy. It was quite hard to hear. I've got to be honest. It was obviously a very windy day. <laughs> I know. I know. But yeah. Can I say, I need to invest in some wrong, stuff. Wrong kind of weather. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Emma Smith. I totally agree with you. Very exciting things. Okay, Deborah, what have you picked out this week's punchline? I picked out the African swine flu. <laughs> Sorry to be so reliable, but... Um, you know, in the in the forest of Dean and the the, the threat of uh, African swine flu. I mean, uh, Ed Druitt, who does a was mentioned in it. Um, he does lots of safari trips, and you know there is a worry about uh, people leaving sandwiches. I think that's uh, probably a minor one. Uh, I have found and reported people leaving, look, you know, big sausages. I suspect they came from a a supermarket beginning with L because I might have seen them on the shelves there in a jar but these are foreign uh, pork uh, which does pro you know provide quite a risk and I you know obviously you get professional safari people which is different to uh, local people wanting to show uh, wild so, boar so, so putting food down to tempt them is, uh, is so this, is, this is wild boar eating other pig products yeah. that could cause uh, uh, a disease within if, the... I mean it's it's basically on the continent not here but the threat is huge if people bring infected meat over to this country um, and illegal imports are the worst but also it can come in other forms that are legal uh, it, of course the idea is that it shouldn't ever reach the, the animals but people do like to leave food out for the boar in order to tempt them either to shoot them or to show people to them. Um, I've seen it, I've found it, I've reported it. Yes, uh, absolutely terrible. It's a bit like pe people who feed the seagulls, you know, just make you so angry. Anyway, <laughs> thanks ever so much for that. Lou, what have you got for us, please? The I've the got two stories, just really quickly. The first one is about the lovely locks, about the fact that our Gloucester Sharpness Canal has been recognised nationally by the Sunday Times in the top seven waterway destinations, which is amazing because our canals around here are fantastic. We love them. I think really discovered them more in lockdown and then really continue to use them. Um, and I, it would be a miss of me if I uh, didn't do a big plug and thank you, Mark, for covering. So Link Charity are holding a polo uh, networking day on the 31st of May. Um, we we held it last year. It was absolutely fantastic. It's at both at Polo Club. It's a great day of uh, fizz, polo and networking and just a great way for people to raise profile of their business. We've had some amazing feedback from last year, but ultimately it raises huge money for us as an organisation. And so we'd really, really like you to have a look at our website and please book tickets. The early bird ticket promotion is uh, running until next week. So you can get your tickets uh, more cheaply at the moment. Thank you okay. very, very much. 
And there's a coach, isn't there? You get a coach there as well. There is, yeah. We we make it really easy for you. And if you're going to have a few glasses of champagne, um, yeah, the coach runs from Chatham Race Course there and back. So you don't need to worry about getting to both at Polo Club and just have a great day with us. We really, really love as many people to join us as we can. I thought that's a great idea. Okay, that's all we've got time for. I'd just like to thank my fantastic panel for today. Thank you ever so much for joining us. My wonderful sponsors, accountants, business advisors, Hayeswoods, and all of you for watching the show. If you like the show, please like, share, and subscribe. And we'll be back again next week. Uh, but in between, remember, it's all in the punchline. Bye. <laughs> Bye.